right, so let's get started. Welcome to the second day of the MERN Symposium. Yesterday we had a wonderful array of talks, tributes, and a wonderful reception. I hope everyone enjoyed themselves. So let's have another, uh, let's start another great day. We're gonna start off today uh, with a series of talks. Rob Lempert is going to uh, launch us here and he's gonna talk about, well, I'm, his title is, is reduce what we aspire to, to do with uncertainty. So I think I mangled that title a little bit, but take it away. Okay, great. Let me, uh, hello everybody. Let me see if I can get my um, slides up again. Okay, great. Okay, good. So, um. Yeah, no, I'm really uh, pleased to be here virtually, but uh, really sorry not to uh, be there in person. Um, we had a death in the family a couple of weeks ago, which was sort of messed up travel and things. And also I did not, wasn't able to uh, to, to rummage through my photo album to, to, to find pictures of, of me and Linda. So um, I'll just have, have words connecting us. Um, but um, Linda's really been central to, to, to much of my work through my career. Um, uh, I, I came to the whole climate change topic via policy. And, you know, I, I work at RAND, um, which is a policy place. And so I originally came to climate change um, working with economists and, and risk analysts um, diving into this, uh, this, this challenge. And, you know, very much found that I, I, I thought that the way that, that, we initially were using what is known about science, and my, my training is in, in condensed matter physics, really didn't match what we knew. And so much of my career has been trying to, to fix the policy analytic methods to, to better match what, what, what the science can and cannot say. Um, Linda wasn't my first you know, deep connection with, with, with the climate science and modeling community. Uh, but she has been, you know, sort of the, the the most exciting, the most sort of deep, stimulating, and 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 sort of a a, a fabulous comrade in arms in, in 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 much of this work, and and much of our connection is is really been around the the question I stuck here as my title is reduce really what we should aspire to do with uncertainty and. And Linda was really instrumental in, in, in getting me involved in the Climate Research Committee, the IPCC, a lot of other panels. And, and the two of us kind of conspired on uh, a lot on this question. And so what I want to do with my talk is really lay out where some of these ideas um, have, have come to and, and you know, give, give Linda and you all a, a chance to say, oh, my God, what, what happened? So anyway, let's, uh, let's dive in. Um, Okay, so I mean, in, in some sense, to give the story in, in a slide or two, the, the, the big idea is that we can shape our future, you know, we as a society, even when we can't predict it. And so if you start making a list of sort of the high level things about what we know about the future, um, the first is we know we're going to get surprised. And the second is if we don't, you know, gather up the best information we do have, uh, we're, we're not going to steer very well. And sort of how to resolve or, or, or make those two, two things less intention is, is a big part of the story. And so, you know, it may seem obvious that using quantitative um, scientific information, quantity, but I say analysis here because the, the economists get to play too, even though their uncertainties are much bigger than the climate uh, scientists. Um, it may seem obvious that quantitative analysis can best inform policy by making predictions, by saying what's going to happen. But while that is often a good thing to do, and is certainly the core of the scientific method, it can complicate the use of quantitative analytics when uncertainties are deep. We'll talk more about that in a second. And the, the, the policy questions are contested. Um, and so fortunately, there's a better way um, and so at least one way of looking at this is, is wrapped around this, what's come to be called decision-making under deep uncertainty, where instead of using your analytics as prediction engines, you're using them really to stress test alternative hypotheses about how we ought to act and see how those work over a wide range of futures and use that information to try to identify policies that prove 
robust and resilient, that is, do pretty well when you stress test them over a wide range of futures. And so this sort of analytics emphasizes multiple objectives because people care about different things. And if you try to reduce that to a single utility function, you're basically you know, favoring some groups over others and multiple scenarios because again, we're trying to stress test over a wide range of futures, not make a best estimate prediction and optimize against that. And it becomes a very iterative process of goal setting. What do we want to do? Stress testing, how might we fail to get to our goals and coming up with solutions that fix or address some of the challenges with the stress test. And uh, sort of a touchstone phrase I very much like comes from my uh, uh, colleague, Steve Bankus, is that we're really using the analytics as a prosthesis for the imagination, not to tell us what to do, but to help we humans explore alternative paths do a better job of creatively navigating our paths into the future. Um, interesting connections there to AI, but we can save that for another talk. And um, you know, so true. Uh, an one another set of reasons why these sets of analytic tools I think are, are particularly important is that traditional policy analysis is 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 really becoming more and more inadequate for the world we live in. Um, there's a lot of substance on this slide. We could spend a long time with it, uh, but let me just use it as a way to jump around on buzzwords. But you know, traditional policy analysis, single decision maker, single vision of the common good, predictable systems, even if they're complicated, and that relates to this idea of you know complex versus complicated system. And one way to capture that is the uh, Kinefin framework. Uh, that I show down here. And the essential idea here is that you manage complex systems very different than complicated ones um, because complex systems, we can understand them even when we can't predict them. Today's world, we have polycentric governance. So there's lots of independent authorities interacting, um, definitely interdependent, but independent and interacting, diverse views of the common goods, and the systems are, are, are complex. And challenges uh, include wicked problems. Linda and some others talked about that yesterday. Distrust in institutions, many voices. And then I'll touch on this a little bit at the end, but this idea of the need for transformation. So um, big changes are not is not only something that's being thrown at us, but is something we actually want to make part of our policy uh, goals. So um, a, a quick... Um, uh, diversion on what is actually a really interesting question. And uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, sort of um, uh, measurement and so how you define, you know, what what reducing or improving our understanding of uncertainty is. Um, I said that DMDU enables good decisions without good predictions. So that begs the question of what a good decision is. And that actually turns out to be uh, a really interesting and deep question. Um, um, anybody who has raised or has been a teenager uh, knows that uh, there are lots of cases where seemingly reasonable things can turn out badly and really stupid things can turn out okay. So um, a good outcome is correlated with a good decision, but is not the same thing. So what is a good decision? Um, it really starts to become more, uh, at least... Um, ex ante becomes more of a process question, an anticipatory process question. And this is a list we used in um, AR5, but um, is really a good decisions tend to emerge from processes in which people are explicit about their goals, contemplate the decision from a wide range of views and advantages, consider a lot of alternative options, use the best available science to try to understand the potential consequence of these actions from these multiple points of views, strong focus on trade-off and follow rules and norms, which make the whole thing, uh, the process and its outcomes legitimate. And so as we think about how we use scientific information and the decision processes, um, it this sort of list becomes a useful touchstone. Okay, so let me do the quick overview of you know what is DMDU and how is it different than the ways we 
sometimes think about using policy, uh, scientific information and then dive in <clears throat> to a little bit extended discussion of sort of the current state of the art. So um, traditional risk management begins with a consensus understanding of, of the future. So the first thing we do is come up with an understanding of what future conditions might be. So um, oftentimes this is, you know, the very naive thing of a, a single best estimate uh, prediction of the future. More properly, it's a joint probability distribution over future states of the world. But in all cases, it's it's basically we agree on how we characterize the future, future states, their likelihood, relative their likelihood. And then we have some sort of utility function. And from that, we get the best near-term decision. We can rank our decision options. And then we can do some sensitivity analysis to see how sensitive that is to our um our ranking is to our uh, uh, our uncertainties. Um, and so one can call this predict, then, there we go, then act, because you really need this understanding of the future uh, as a prelude to uh, deciding how to act. And so this is a fabulous set of tools for all sorts of, of problems. And I always say you never get on an airplane if the people who built it and flew it um, didn't work very well in this mode, but it can break down for a class of problems that go under this label, deep uncertainty, of which climate is clearly the uh, one of the archetypes. Um, and all sorts of things can go wrong if you try to put a deeply uncertain problem in a, a predict and act solution in a deeply uncertain box, is that there's huge incentives all over the place to underestimate the uncertainties and hence then come up with brittle, brittle policies that fail sometimes catastrophically if the world doesn't turn doesn't turn out the way you thought it would. Competing analyses can contribute to gridlock because people can attack the projection as opposed to attacking the policy. And in a in a sense, it's 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 it turns out to distract attention from coming up with creative solutions because we spend all our time arguing over predictions. And one not on the list is it, um, it, it, it sometimes contributes to a lack of humility among the experts who claim that they know what's happening when in fact there's, there's a lot of uncertainties around. Um, so this idea of deep uncertainty occurs when parties to a decision do not know. I think Linda, this, this is the same or close to what Linda had yesterday, do not know or do not agree on the likelihood of alternative futures or how actions are related to consequences. So probabilities are imprecise or we don't really even know them at all. And there is model uncertainty. Okay, so what do you do under those conditions? Well, sometimes you turn the analysis backwards. Um, we start with what are we trying to achieve? How do we get there? How, what are the options for getting there? And then use the analytics to stress test the plans. And so I ask questions such as, <clears throat> what, what are the sets of future conditions where our plans are consistent with our goals and where does that fail? And in conditions of deep uncertainty, um, uh, that often is much higher confidence information um, than, uh, than the projection. So for instance, in the case of sea level rise, if I've got an engineered structure that's near, near the coast, um, it's much easier to say what combination of storm surge and sea level rise would cause that, um, that, that structure to fail, then be sure that uh, what exact storm surge and sea level rise we're going to get at some point in the future. Then once you've done those stress tests, we can uh, use that information to identify new and revised policies that are more robust. And there's a whole now emerging um, uh, whole field of this, and uh, this uh, 2019 book is now a, a, a pretty nice and popular touchstone of the different ways of manifesting, implementing this, this fundamental idea. Um, let me show you, um, okay, I'm going to talk about this uh, the stress test and give you a quick example of this and then dive in quickly to some other uh, topics. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is actually a slide that um, 
Um, I showed with Linda at a IPCC a meeting on use of climate information about 10 years ago, um, talking about a RAND study of a couple of years before then um, in support of the US Bureau, Bureau of Recreation on the, on the Colorado Basin. This was the 2012 uh, Colorado Supply and Demand Study policy question, you know, the Colorado is, is system is breaking down. What are potential, what are the vulnerabilities and what are the potential responses? So took a whole bunch of different climate projections, historical record, um, uh, uh, GCM projections, paleo record, various ways of combining those, connected them with the uh, socioeconomic uncertainties, ran many thousands of, of scenarios, um, <clears throat> and then asked what are the appropriate classes of policy responses in each one of those, and then did a big cluster analysis um, to divide that big cloud into these policy relevant scenarios. And in very brief, there's um, business as usual, which is the green bar up above where basically business as usual would work, a whole strip of different sorts of adaptive strategies where if you phased in a whole bunch of actions, um, in the right order, in the right time, you could maintain your objectives uh, in the face of the stresses. And then this transformative region down at the bottom, where even if you did everything on the list of things that people were willing, willing to put on the list of options in 2012, um, you still couldn't maintain your objectives. So it turns out that actually we were well into the transformative um, scenario at this point, and actually reclamation is using these techniques um, in their analytic shop to uh, to to analyze the the, the post twenty twenty six plans. Um, let me say just a few quick words. Um, I should go for what about five ten more minutes. Okay, I'll soon enough. I should do. Um, so um, this is some, some recent work that I've been doing with some colleagues coming off of IPCC AR6, um, uh, really just sort of noting and trying to document um, the extent to which these DMDU ideas have been, uh, uh, been used uh, across the IPCC assessment cycles and then create some suggestions for, for AR7. And so we had a nice mix of auth uh, authors on this paper of people who are authors across the various working groups. Um, in AR6, and you guys all know this, this is uh, the history of the IPCC um, over the last six assessment cycles. And um, uncertainty has been a really big uh, part of the IPCC, and so this is an attempt to hit some of the, the highlights. And the upper bar, uh, the, the, the first assessment report says there were a lot of uncertainties in climates, but we can reduce them. The uh, second assessment report talked about potentials for surprises, so not all uncertainties are going to be reducible. Decided that you really couldn't do cost-benefit analysis by monetizing all, all the damages. Um, the, the third assessment report was the first uh, with an attempt at an uncertainty guidance, how should authors characterize uncertainty, introduced the burning embers, and started to have quotes which were really straight out of the you know, the concepts of the DMDU literature, which are climate change decision, this was in the working group three SPM, climate change decision-making is essentially a sequential process under general uncertainty. The relevant question is not what is the best course for the next 100 years, but rather what is the best course for the near term given the expected long-term climate change and accompanying uncertainties. And then, in the fourth, fifth, and sixth assessment report, um, refining the uncertainty guidance, introducing this risk propeller and that uh, Linda showed us for AR5. Um, in AR6, uh, as a strong statement of what could be called a broad view, a DMDU consistent view of risk, which I give the quote down here. I think, again, Linda showed that um, uh, yesterday. But again, the idea is that while it's it takes probability times, um, um, you know, consequence as the uh, as a subset. It is actually much broader and includes um, uh, the fact that we may be uncertain about both the probabilities and the magnitude of the the drivers of the risk. 
And another key thing in AR6 was to include not only the um, vulnerability exposure um, and, and, uh, and hazard, um, uh, so essentially the drivers, but then also the risks generated by res that humans generate by responding to, to climate related risks, which is also uh, an increasingly important part of the equation. Scenarios through and, and the summary of, of how scenarios have been treated below. Um, uh, DMDU, explicit DMDU ideas have also become, um, have been picked up in the IPPC starting in the third assessment report, uh, which talked about robust decision making, which is a, a, a DMDU method that, that, that I've been very involved with, this idea of computational multi-scenario simulation. The fourth AR4 um, had an uncertainty guidance, which discusses probabilistic and non-probabilistic uncertainty. So captures this idea of imprecise probability, so it doesn't use that language. Um, AR5 had a strong focus on the risk framework, emphasized this idea of complex and non-probabilistic risks, brought in this idea of adaptive pathways, which is a very explicit framework for looking at policies that evolve over time. And then in, in AR6, really an explosion, deep uncertainties now in the glossary. There were uh, cross-chapter boxes and two reports, which um, explicitly discussed deep uncertainty. And then in a way I'll, I'll show you in a second, um, uh, explicitly laying out the sea level rise projections to display deep uncertainty and connecting to this idea of adaptive pathways. Um, this is the uncertainty guidance, which I'm going to skip um, in the interest of time. Um, so this adaptive pathways idea, which is the DMD methodology, is, is both a visual and a, and a conceptual idea for thinking about policies that evolve over time. And so the idea is you can imagine, in this particular example, is a sea level rise one. So imagine a current situation, which is, say, a layout of physical infrastructure near a shore. And that is go had a certain set of performance objectives it's aiming to achieve, and that is will achieve its objective over a certain amount of sea level rise indicated by the gray line. And then at some point, there's a threshold where uh, the sea has risen sufficiently far so it fails. Um, but we don't, in fact, know how fast the seas are going to rise. So if the seas rise slowly, the current situation may last for, say, 25 years. But if they rise quickly, uh, you know, that may only last for uh, some fraction of five or 10. Um, so we might pursue other options. And in option A, uh, we could transfer to this other policy, um, which is a little circle, little subway map idea captures. And this one might um, be good for uh, indefinitely, no matter how much the seas rise, but it might have near-term uh, near term high costs. Um, there might be a whole other combination of different actions, B and C, which in different combinations can take us out to different levels of sea level rise and have <clears throat> different uh, amounts of near-term uh, difficulty or cost. And these maps then lay out and allow decision makers to think about their options in the context of different ways and different scenarios, in this case of sea level rise. So. Um, very much with this idea in mind, working group one, uh, for the first time, provided its sea level rise projections with probabilistic um, uh, distributions for the well understood sea level rise processes, but then also provided what they called storylines, but essentially scenarios for um, uh, less well understood processes and giving uh, decision makers what those might look like. Um, which gives them both, in some sense, a worst case, but also information on what sort of processes and what sort of indicators they ought to look, look for to see if that case, that scenario is emerging. The projections are also presented not only by, you know, sort of the standard, how much sea level rise might you get by a certain time, but also by when. So would you get a certain amount? So if you know, for instance, that your infrastructure can handle a meter of sea level rise, but not more. This, they give ranges of times when you 
might first see a level, see that level, and you know when the the period of risk unfolds over. And then there was some discussion yesterday about you know how do you take these general ideas in specific cases. Um, uh, some of the uh, the working group two chapters try to grapple with this by putting together essentially these generic adaptive pathways maps for particular types of decision making in this case for coastal cities and settlements by the sea. Um, let's see, and uh, just quickly, um, there was a the the box in there was a special in the special report on oceans and cryosphere had a box focused on deep uncertainty, which was really focused, though, on the ideas of how do we reduce deep uncertainty. Um, and then by the end of the AR6 cycle, really focused on how do you respond to deep uncertainty. And so the, uh, the decision-making chapter has a cross-chapter box on, deep un on different strategies for responding to deep uncertainty, lower gets, adaptive ways, keeping options open. Um, and then th these ideas were picked up in a lot of working group two, and then in somewhat different ways in working group three. So um, DMDU has played an important role in, um, I think, a lot of the emerging decision-making on, on climate. And in particular, it's uh, been picked up pretty strongly in uh, the IPCC. So. Hopefully I left a little bit of time for questions and thank you very much. Thanks very much for the wonderful uh, presentation. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Rob. Hi, Rob. It's Linda. Hi. Hi, hi. Um, so I am... Um, I've of course seen you give talks like this a number of times, but each time you add something new and colorful, uh, which is okay. Oh, good. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to formulate a useful question about <laughs> do you do you know of examples given the the various stakeholder groups you've worked with where the DMDU approach just didn't work or is the construction of the method sort of such that it can't fail in a sense if you <laughs> <laughs> um no, no great great question and the um uh one very clear answer is um uh it's it, it, it's been super hard so far with transportation agencies um uh, <laughs> and uh they you know they are um We've been actually tr been doing a lot of work with um, transportation agencies who are very clear that they face deep uncertainty because not only are they being uh, in many jurisdictions being told they need to go to zero emissions over the course of a couple of decades, um, you know, um, they they also are facing really profound technology shocks. You know, the, the line you know where they they start doing their planning and. Um, you know, they trip over mobility options, um, which are now parked outside of their, um, uh, you know, their headquarters, which they, um, uh, which didn't exist when they started doing the planning, right? Um, and so the, you know, the 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 world has changed during the two years they did their plan. Um, and um, but just the models constructs they have, um, and the way that they layer, you know, their strategic models, and then the way that they. They need to do very detailed modeling in part uh, um, uh, because of regulatory requirements. You know, you need to do this sort of calculation to get federal funding, that sort of thing. Makes it, um, and how long it takes to actually run a case makes it really hard to do this sort of analysis. So, um, you know, we're chipping away at it and it probably involves having, um, um, you know, norms and, and procedures for using very much simpler models and doing a lot of cases there and bringing it in. Um, uh, but, but, but that's a, you know, sort of one of the most difficult where, where the, just the technical requirements of doing the, the multiple scenarios has become, is, is, is still overwhelming. But you have hope? I have hope, but I'm, I'm a hopeful person. 
Yes, you are. <laughs> Thank you very, thanks very much. Um, why don't we uh, transition over to our next speaker, Melissa? Come on down. I'm assuming. <laughs> so a little bit different because I'm actually going to talk about some of our very recent work too with Linda and Seth and Rachel um, and the crew, and then some of the pathway to this recent work as well. Um, so there might even be results in here you haven't seen yet because we haven't actually met recently about some of this, right? So, oh, feedback. Yes, okay, that's better. Um, all right, so this is all about differential credibility, essentially, in downscaling methods, dynamical and statistical. Um, and somehow I... Okay, find the little arrow to click on it. Um, as Linda mentioned yesterday, she likes to include quotes in her presentations. This one is actually from the uh, beginning of a talk the both of us put together in 2011 for an hour and a half long lecture on uncertainty at DMI that I ended up giving. Um, relevant there, relevant here. Um, and that was the one experience I think you were supposed to talk at this workshop, but I ended up having to talk and learn about um, Bayesian statistical modeling to give this talk at a workshop. It was like that nightmare you have as a kid growing up where you have shown up for a test, but it missed all of the class before that from my point of view, because I had to cram a lot for that. Not my subject expertise, but this is relevant because the quest for certainty blocks the search for meaning. And really here, we're not going for increased certainty and in embracing the uncertainty what we're really doing is search, searching for deeper meaning in our projections um, so process level meaning from this point of view and i tried to figure out where some of this terminology came from credibility differential credibility um, and process level analysis and i've sort of failed at pinpointing some of it because of course it evolved over time oops that is supposed to animate. What happened to the other slide? Okay, so I had a whole lit review in here and it's in the slide deck I have. I have no idea where it went. So I'll just try to remember this. It looks like reliability and credibility came, apart, came from your 2002 paper with Filippo, really, the REA paper. So reliability and credibility didn't really show up until the early knots in the literature. And so that spawned some of it, but a lot of that was looking at what's credible in the future via agreement only of the models, but also you know, how well the models are doing with their historical climate. Um, so it's evolved from there to more, less of a metric necessarily to a lot of maps to some extent. Um, and then there were quite a few people in the knots also looking at process level analysis, but per regional climate model. So Ruby's group was doing some of this with atmospheric rivers with Yoon, and the folks at Iowa State were doing quite a bit this, of this when it came to warm season precipitation in the plains. Um, and I was doing quite a bit of this in grad school. But um, <laughs> so that's the start of it. And then I guess, I first met Linda really at a 2008 model workshop, NARCAP users meeting, and I met the whole NARCAP PI team there, but I didn't really think much about it because I was still in grad school at that point. This is like January of 2008, but we met again in January of 2009 at my AMS poster here. Um, it was set up as a dartboard and it was really expert judgment. Um, before I knew what expert judgment was because I had this hanging next to it here, it says, place a hash mark next to the simulation you think is best. Um, and then votes made by DART or other semi-random selector are valid. Linda, you and Bill Gutowski were the, sort of the last ones to come by this poster. It was a really busy poster. And you were the only one to throw the DART at the poster. No one else actually wanted to throw the DARTs. <laughs> Maybe a little hazardous for busy poster hall, but your odds of missing from two feet away are fairly low. And then we went off straight after that, where I had a formal interview for the postdoc here. It was seen as an opportune time to actually do that because we were all there in person, didn't have to be on the phone. And 
Six months later, I ended up here where we sort of embarked a little bit more on this differential credibility, not just process level credibility. Hey, look, I have no idea how this slide got over here. Um, so we had a bunch of papers um, starting right off the bat really with my postdoc, we started looking at the North American monsoon and the credibility in the different NARCAP simulations. And this is really the first time the differential credibility I think is mentioned. Um, and Linda really had this idea of trying to actually differentiate and rank the models based on how they were doing with all the different processes that drive the monsoons. I was somewhat hesitant in differentiating them because I think the NARCAP PIs were getting a little sick of me telling them what was wrong with all their runs all the time, but <laughs> modelers can take things personally sometimes, but not always. We're pretty objective, but yeah. <laughs> no, no. So we did do the expert elicitation with the NARCAP PIs too for the monsoon work to see if everybody's thoughts lined up with what we were getting in the analysis. Eventually published it. It didn't help that Vanessa had moved at that point. So it took a while to get it published. Um, and that's the picture I used every time we talked about this. Those are the NARCAP PIs um, <laughs> when it came to the expert judgment experiment. We extended this then for the central plains and warm season precipitation there, um, really looking then at also the credibility of the future projections much more in depth through the various processes that drive precipitation there. Um, and here we had almost a binary ranking of the models. They either did or didn't do a good job in this region. And for the ones that really weren't raining for the right reasons, I would argue you'd throw them out. Um, don't use them. And we also tried weighting, and some of this weighting was process level. There were weather regimes in here. Um, we basically found that it didn't really make a difference if you were looking at ensemble projections. And it couldn't make a difference unless you put all the weight on the outliers, which you might not want to do. And it also, it also um, didn't really provide a credible ranking of how well the models were doing relative to all of this process level analysis up here that we compared it to. Um, so during a lot of this discussion, we started to talk about, well, what if we don't just do all this process level credibility analysis on dynamical downscaling method? Can we throw statistical downscaling into the mix? Um, and this is after we brought on Rachel, who is gonna do some of the statistical downscaling. <laughs> I'll let her mention that. <laughs> um, so we, you know, have looked at some of this, there's literature. And when it comes to comparing statistical and dynamical methods, oftentimes people are comparing one RCM simulation to one statistical method, um, sometimes pretty simple. And they're the conclusion of all of these papers. And there are a lot of them. And maybe there's some we're missing is that different methods produce different results. Linda throws her hands up. I was gonna say no shit, but... Um, <laughs> Because I feel like this is a presentation where I can actually say that. Um, so, hmm, I know, which is fine. Um, anyway, so where has this journey led us as we try to compare the statistical and dynamical downscaling methods? Say for a little while, we've been down a rabbit hole um, because it's hard. Um, we tried some stuff that didn't go anywhere. And we're using a lot of different downscaling methods here. So we're looking at the GCMs that are driving all of this. We've got the different dynamical, two different dynamical methods. We chose just WARF and RegCM. Two spatial statistical methods. One of them is a convolutional neural network um, or UNET that Seth put together. LOCA, which is really heavily used in all of the recent NCA reports. St SDSM, or the statistical downscaling method. QDM, which is a quantile delta method, a very simple one that's just thresholding and scaling to get down to the fire, finer resolution. These are all point methods over here. And then dummy, which is just kind of random noise. Everything's shuffled together. And it is the method that all of the rest should easily be when we're doing this, um, because there's no real science. Um, the way we finally got through this was by pretty heavily simplifying the problem. Um, so with all of those methods, we're focusing on 
downscaling these three different GCMs here, the MPI, the GFDL, and the HADGEM. Um, we have chosen to just focus on the month of May in the Southern Great Plains um, at one point that kind of represents the region, but we have all these point-based methods. So we basically had to choose a point somewhere. Um, and we're just looking at wet and dry days and sort of what's driving those. Wet days are defined as greater than three millimeters, so about the 80th percentile and up for this region. Dry days are less than a trace. And then there's this moist in between here that we don't really focus on. It's fuzzy, right? Those are sort of like tail end precipitation events. It's hard to see what's driving them exactly. And so this simplifies the problem, reduces the influence of model intensity bias and focuses on just the atmospheric setup for precipitation. And this plot over here shows wet and, the wet and dry partitioning in each of one of these methods for the historical period on top and the future on the bottom. It's kind of less important than everything else, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. So we evaluated precipitation, but we evaluated its drivers. So these fields that we have here on the right, go through in a minute, are really, pointing at the processes that combine to produce precipitation here, that is moisture and lift, two main ingredients for precipitation. Um, you can throw instability into the mix if you wanted to for this location, but it's not really forcing whether or not it rains here. I mean, it's important, but not to the same extent. So we have at 850 millibars or 1,000 feet up, um, moisture advection by these Southern Great Plains low-level jets. You can see these white arrows in this darker area here. Um, at mid-levels, we have a trough right downstream of our point here. And at upper levels, we 250 millibars, the jet stream, which is indicated here by the white line. And we're right ahead of a jet max, so in an area for ideal lift. Um, and all of this is sort of summarized in this lower left corner then. This is what we're looking for on days when it rains. So these are, this is the climatology of just wet days. Um, so question is, do the downscaling methods actually you know, rain on days that look like this that make sense? So that's the same plot on the right, but how we partitioned some of this analysis. So when it rains, we're looking at the GCM large scale forcing, all of these fields on the right. Um, and the precipitation in the GCMs. For the statistical methods, they're not doing anything dynamical. So we're gonna look at the forcing from the GCMs and whether or not that matches up with days when it rains in the statistical downscaling methods. And then for the RCMs, they produce their own large scale forcing. They're just driven at the edges by the GCM. So we're gonna look at their large scale forcing on their wet days. And what we found is that the GCMs can, to start, at least generally capture the upper atmosphere climatology in May. Okay, okay nice. Now we can see the tops. This is just general May climatology, not wet days or dry days. Um, it's almost like a distinct weather regime for this region. Um, and they all show decent patterns of moisture transport out of the Gulf of Mexico. So you can see the GFDL's uh, moisture transport here is a little weak. Mid levels look okay, and upper levels are where it starts to get a little funny. Um, the top here is reanalysis, so it's what the GCM should look like. Um, the MPI is pretty good in terms of its upper level jet. The GFDL has some pretty intense ridging going on here. Um, and then the head gem run, that's even worse. And we also have, you know, this area of like almost no flow right out over our area of interest in May. So we're inheriting these problems into all of these methods to start. Um, and these are ordered such that throughout this talk, we have what will end up being MPI as being good, GFDL being a little ugly and, or sorry, GF, good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Seth. Yes, Hedgem is a little ugly. So this is what the downscaling methods are inheriting. So now we're going to look at just the atmospheric conditions on days when it rains. Um, and this is the anomaly from the GCMs down here. 
and from the air interim at the top. And these first two columns from that general May climatology. So these are just the wet days now. Um, you see that, you know, the MPI looks pretty good all the way across again. Those patterns match up with the top. The GFDL, not necessarily enough moisture transport, again, with that upper level jet problem. And the circulation here is actually kind of shifted on days when it rains and it's sitting right over an area that should be sinking air um, on days when it rains, not conducive to precip. And the head gems, even a little worse than that. So this is, again, that baseline credibility on the wet days now that all these methods are inheriting. We actually start looking at um, the RCMs and what they do on the, the days when it rains. These are now results of the REGCM for having downscaled all of these. Um, you can see that now they're all actually pretty good. So these are the dynamical downscaling methods, um, basically demonstrating their added value. They can even fix large scale error, right? Fr inherited from the GCMs. Um, and the REGCM is a little bit better than this in our wharf simulations because the wharf simulations were nudged at large scales. Um, and so while wharf that I'm not gonna show because for lack of time, um, does actually improve on the circulation quite a bit from HADGEM and GFDL. That improvement's just not quite as good as what REGCM4 is doing since it's not nudged in the, throughout the domain. The other thing we found is that the complex statistical methods can actually make things fairly bad when the input they're getting are bad. Like they make it worse. So <laughs> this is a uh, article convolutional neural network or AI method that Seth came up with. And it really kind of exaggerates some of the bad patterns. You can see here when it gets the MPI as its driving conditions, it does really well. Like on days when it rains, it looks like it should be raining in the rest of the atmosphere. In GFDL, it's getting a little wonky. I don't know what this atmospheric pattern is really. I have no explanation for it. And then in the head gem, we actually have dry flow from the north. Um, this pattern is complete opposite of what it should be. We're upstream of a ridge. And again, with the jet stream here, um, that's sinking air. We're right under a ridge. So exactly the opposite of what you want when it's raining is when the CNN is raining in this case. Um, so, um, and this, this, this is the worst example. Some of the other complex statistical methods, LOCA and um, SDSM also do something similar. Those are the two more complex ones. They make things worse when they're inheriting bad boundary conditions. Um, I'm gonna skip this one and go to this one. So um, we turned all of those different fields into a metric in the end, or Seth did, relative credibility metric to just summarize all those plots because there's no way we can put plots for every method inside the body of the paper. Um, so this is our relative credibility score here. Um, the different colors are the different GCMs and the different symbols and rows are all of these different statistical downscaling methods here. Um, so what you can really see is that when the GCM is good, so all of the blue here, all of the methods perform fairly well. Hmm? Yes, even the dummy method is performing fairly well. Uh, so the dummy method is this bottom row here. Not too bad. Um, random noise, not too bad. Uh, the GFDL is in green. That one wasn't so great, kind of bad, right? And the dynamical methods are doing fairly well, and in some cases improving on what's going on. The dynamical methods are the triangles. But then we can see that some of these uh, the greens here, all of these crossed ones in these three rows, um, sort of moving to the left. So they're even less credible than what the GCM is providing. And then from the red, these are all the head gem driven methods. Uh, you can see that the uh, two dynamical methods actually enhance the credibility of that simulation despite its um, bad boundary conditions that it's providing. But um, all of the complex methods are actually now doing worse than the dummy method. So. Um, giving bad boundary conditions to the more complex methods means you're doing worse than random noise in this case. Um, the simpler methods, the QDM and simple, they stick really close to the credibility of the GCMs. And this is true throughout. 
So um, I would argue personally that nothing really below 0.7 here is really all that credible um, because we're inheriting some really bad boundary conditions and potentially making it worse. Um, so if we were going to go for a zero one binary weighting of these models, I would just throw out those. In terms of future change and what makes it plausible, oh, I don't have it, three minutes, okay. We've seen that the upper level conditions here, I won't go through this, are actually not bad. They match our a priori understanding of what should happen in a warming climate. So in this case, um, this isn't necessarily going to inform whether or not our future projections are plausible because all of this is pretty plausible. The uh, jet streams moving north, we have warming and more moisture. This all makes sense. So um, what's really gonna drive the credibility in this case is that historical performance. And if we apply all of that to our frequency of precipitation, um, what we're left with is an increase in the number of dry days. So everything driven by MPI here generally has an increase in the number of dry days. You can see this orange bar moving to the left for all of the future simulations, which are on the bottom. Um, and the same is actually true of some of these GFDL simulations that aren't that bad. So not a specific magnitude, but an increase in the number of dry days, which corresponds to an increase of the or decrease in the number of wet days, generally speaking. So I'm not going to necessarily go through the summary of that. Um, I'd like to say that I'd like to continue some of this maybe with future funding. I think this would be easily generalizable, this methodology to weather regimes, particularly instead of just choosing one month in one location, it looks like a weather regime, because it is. Um, but then we could actually test it out on some other regions too, more, more directly. So this is a very recent photo. Um, Oh, yes, yeah. with the dart, I didn't even think about it yet. Yeah, so this is a re recent experiment with hatching throwing, hatching throwing for a group. Um, we all ended well. Yeah, good bonding experience. Um, I'm going to take one more minute, though, and um, actually talk about one of the risk groups. Um, other experiments, it's the examination of the influence of peep shape on microwave-induced explosions. <laughs> so this originated... Um, I think Seth brought in some peeps. Somebody brought in some peeps. Yeah, I don't quite remember who brought in the peeps initially. Yeah, yeah. But I think you didn't know that what happened to them in a microwave. And this, after doing it once, spawned a tradition for pretty much any holiday where you can get peeps. Um, and I got to help this out. This tradition sort of, ooh, let me remute that. Um, unfortunately died because of COVID and we all started working from home, but I hope the group picks it back up again. And I intend to start burning some sugar in my office building as well. So anyway, thanks for all your guidance and mentorship. We have questions for, we have a few, you started a couple minutes late, so I, we have you know, a few minutes for questions. I was wondering, so did you do the simulation or did you do your analysis with the bias corrected RCM simulations or the raw? No, RCM we used the raw RCM simulations. So wouldn't you have, so kind of the conclusion is that you, your process base is better with the RCM simulations, but those preset values are going to contain the biases of the RCM, whereas the statistical will hit it. Well, I mean, they'll hit it for the historical, right? Yeah, so this is this is actually, yeah, they're designed to do that, right? Yeah, yeah, by definition, they the do it. the reason why we didn't 
one of the reasons why we didn't look at mean precipitation and didn't necessarily include precipitation in any of those rankings because the statistical methods, because they hit historical precipitation right on the nose, would always perform yeah, better. Always. Whereas um, the RCMs could have an intensity bias that affects that mean for any number of reasons, and it might just be the configuration or the microphysics choices, but they may still rain on the right days for the right reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hey, Melissa, this is really interesting talk. Uh, so I'm wondering for the CNN approach, is it using some large scale circulation as the predictors to predict precipitation? Yes. And then at the end, when you were evaluating whatever that metrics that you were using, uh, so so that's more or less based on the relationship or something like that. Whereas if you look at just the precipitation produced by CNN, they it probably has really good statistical properties or something like that. Yeah, I think the historical precipitation properties are actually pretty good. It's when you start distinguishing when it rains versus mm -hmm. what the atmosphere is doing, it starts to fall apart mm -hmm. um, for the methods where the boundary conditions aren't great. And yes, the uh, CNN and the SDSM were set up using the same boundary conditions that you would give for. Mm -hmm. That's a point. As, essentially, yeah, except, you know, at a price for one of the methods. So we tried to put them on as equal footing as possible. Yes, um, really interesting talk. I live in a county in Pennsylvania where we're using um, uh, data scenarios that are available through the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit. That's I can't remember the name of the tool, but it provides scenarios at a county scale based on LOCA, 32 ensemble mean, we're using a range of results of you know 90th percentile to 10th percentile. We think we're doing this right. And I'm looking at your slides and I'm going, crap. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of users out you know, in county level, local level, where that's the most accessible data for non-climate science folks. Any thoughts on, on that that might calm me down or, or, or encourage me to, to not do that anymore? I'm going to answer that. <laughs> okay. So I think it comes down, unfortunately, this is a big problem. Basically, I, I refer to it as the credibility versus convenience. Problem. Right. Very convenient. <laughs> and um, that somehow the convenience of statistical downscaling, um, pretty much up to this point, always beats out the credibility. And I think that's pretty problematic. Um, yeah, I could go into yeah. a story <laughs> as to why there's no regional modeling in the NCA5. Um, but I'm not going to do that <laughs> right now. I want to have a, add a comment to that, which is that I think it's a problem, but I think the issue is that people don't know how much they're missing. I don't think that anyone's doing anything wrong and that they're using data that is available to them. Yeah. And especially when you don't have a lot of resources, you have to use what's produced. The problem is that people then put out information that this is, this is climate change uncertainty. <laughs> And that is not the answer. And so I think being able to say we're using the best available information we have now, but we're developing a flexible framework that as we gain more information, we start to use more credible data sets, we start having other types of uncertainty included, we can update our decisions. And so I would, if you're talking to people, I would say this is a great starting point, but this may change. I mean, it's going to change and try to think about a way in which you can start to consider, can we incorporate more information as we move forward, as it becomes available? And I will I will add on to that that you know I I provide dynamical data to people, um, and the thing I always tell them is use lot use as many simulations as you can because the one thing we know for certain is that whatever future pr you predict that prediction is going to be wrong. Yes. Right? <laughs> Any point value that you predict is wrong. You should be looking at the envelope of possibilities, and so <clears throat> you know. Your envelope might be off if some of these, if some of the things you're looking at have low credibility, but you're at least still looking at the range of things. And it's probably not going to be like the whole thing is wrong. So you're at least getting into the vicinity of, of what's probably going to happen. Okay. There's still a non zero chance it's all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. The thing is, 
hard, right? <laughs> yes. And it takes a lot of effort and not everybody can handle it, but sometimes we actually get some conversion. Uh, well, go back to Rob's presentation about, you know, decision-making under uncertainty. It's what decisions are you making and how beholden are they to specific projections versus dealing with other possibilities? Okay, I think I think I'm gonna rein it in. This is a great conversation. I don't want to like more possible I, lunch discussion. Yeah, um, more, more we'll touch on this discussion. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to our, our next speaker, Jennifer Jacobs. Come on down. And yeah, thank you for getting her presentation up. Uh Jennifer. Uh, is speaking to us on the road less traveled, partnering with Linda Murn to develop transportation resilience to a changing climate. So, yeah, let me tell you about myself. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Jacobs, University of New Hampshire, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And I am a water resources engineer, practicing surface water hydrologist. And I spent about the past 10 years. A little confused. I at NCAR I represent the transportation community. To the climate scientists, I'm the transportation community. I'm the face of them. And to the transportation community, I do my darndest to represent the climate change community. And so you can understand why I'm a little bit confused. And the fact that I don't know a lot of the faces in this room, some I know well, but I don't know a lot of faces means that probably a lot of you don't know very much about transportation and climate change. And you probably don't know about Linda's role in transportation and climate change. So I'm gonna take my time to fill you in on that. Let's see if we got that arrow, click, where are we? There we go. All right, so late to the party. There we go. Uh, Linda mentioned Hurricane Katrina, 2008. That got the transportation community, Federal Highway, starting to think about the vulnerability of their system. Fast forward to Hurricane Sandy, hit New York City, and that really changed things. That really got the momentum going. That's 2008. The talks we heard yesterday, 30, 40 years of history in some of the communities. Um, there's probably a whole dissertation into why that was the case. And just pulled a little screenshot off of yesterday's. That was from like 30 years ago, wasn't that? And look at those impact sectors. None of them are transportation, none of them are infrastructure. And yet infrastructure is one of the ideal partners for climate change. And why? Because whatever we're doing right now, we're planning right now, it's going to be in the ground at a minimum for 30 years. It could be lasting another hundred years. And we don't have the luxury of making changes of adaptation or very little of that luxury. So 2010, what did we know? Well, my guess is if I asked some of the climate scientists back in 2010, that first one, you might not have believed. But the engineers, the research engineers did know that climate change existed and they did know that sea level rise was real. And that's some progress. They also knew that if things are changing, they should be accounting for these things in their engineering design because engineers like to get things right. But they also knew that current standards of practice didn't allow them to be able to make these changes to account for, these cha for changing conditions. What didn't they know? Lots of things. And this is kind of a fun place to start. So climate change speak. Conservative, you ask a bridge engineer what conservative means, that means they're gonna design for a very high standard, the most extreme event. You ask a climate scientist what a conservative means? <laughs> yeah, total opposite, right? All right, so some of that language came up yesterday. What data are available? how to obtain and interpret data, how not to say the term data, but to use climate model output, how climate change impacts bridges and roads. Nobody had really even start to bring those together in 2010. That figure up on the right, 
no good standing bridge engineer, pavement engineer, had never seen that figure. Yeah, uh, and they didn't know how they were going to go about trying to think about how to include climate change in standard design practice. All right, so the kickoff. So this is before I knew Linda, but that upper figure should look a little bit familiar to some of my NARCAP friends. And like we heard yesterday, a lot of the good science that comes out comes because people talk to each other and they get together and they have dinner and they learn about each other's families. And Joe Sias Daniel and I are running partners. So I'm the water person. I've been working with big data sets, climate data for forever. And she's the pavement engineer, hardcore. She designs that black stuff. And we got to talking on one of our runs about climate change. Turns out pavement engineers had never considered climate change but they have something that's a lot like a land surface model that says how their pavement responds to climate variables. Kind of neat. They feed in a time series of climate data and then they stick a truck or a car on top of that pavement and they see the pavement as design. Does it break down or does it last? Does it rut? Does it crack? And so what's kind of the obvious thing to do? Let's stick some climate change mo model output in there and see what happens. And so fortunately, Ernst Linder, statistician, had been hanging out with some of the other statisticians who knew something about climate change and pointed us over to NARCAP. And we looked at that 1.5 to 3 degrees Fahrenheit increase in average temperature for out to 2050. And we said, what's that going to do to our roads? And the bottom right-hand figure says, you know what's going to happen? Pavement life is going to decrease when the roads get hotter. Why? When roads get hotter, you put a big heavy truck on it, you get these big ruts in it, those ruts don't just pop back. You just trashed your road. That would be the technical term. <laughs> it's a 10% decrease. Hey, is that, that's not that much, right? One lane mile to reconstruct of a highway costs a million dollars. Yeah. Like this is serious money. So if you have a 10% decrease in the lifetime because you had warming conditions over the lifetime of that pavement, you cost all of us taxpayers a lot of money. All right, so we published that. And then, you know, like all good problems, you get excited about things. And so we expanded this beyond us. And fortunately, NSF had a nice call at the time that said, uh, Let's, that you could bring together sustainability and resilience and develop these networks. And so we applied to bring together climate scientists and transportation engineers, as well as some social scientists, researchers, uh, federal highway folks, uh, state departments of transportation. And one of the tricks was we didn't know that many climate scientists at the time. And Ernst said, you should talk to Linda Mearns. And I looked up Linda Mearns and I was like, I'm not talking to her. <laughs> little did I know that wasn't the reason why I didn't want to talk to her she looked like a big deal and I was like I, you know I'm gonna get turned down flat but Linda said yes because Linda's pretty curious about things so fast forward we created the infrastructure and climate network and the good thing about these NSF RCNCs networks is that they are funded to bring people together, feed them lots of food and put them up in nice hotels and help them have a conversation. They don't have to do any specific research. And so people kept coming back year after year and having these phenomenal conversations and we learned a lot from each other. So let's talk a little bit about some of those things we learned. Starting off, the first conversation had the climate scientist explaining to us Climate 101. Um, news to the engineers. Then we flipped the table and we let the engineers explain to the climate scientist how pavement design and bridge design works. This is a, pay that was pretty much it. <laughs> You've been driving on it. This is a bridge. Some of the best conversations were between Linda and the bridge engineers, in particular, Aaron Bell. And Aaron Bell's a card carrying bridge engineer, and she brought in a stack of design standards for bridges. It's this thick. And she said, I'm going to pull out the parts that are the climate parts. A couple pages. 
So bridge engineers are concerned about a whole lot of things besides the changing climate. <laughs> and, and what Aaron said was, I'm a lot more worried about a boat, a ship hitting my bridge. Wow. Yeah. I pulled this and then Linda said, you know, this, this belongs in here. And shortly after Aaron said that, that's my uh, bridge, my middle bridge between New Hampshire and Maine. Um, that tanker got loose and it hit the uh, middle bridge and uh, closed it down. Um, and I think we're all familiar with what happened in Baltimore recently. Engineers can't design for that. It's too much. It's way over the top of what you can possibly, what you can possibly handle. Um, so other conversations, really neat stuff. I had this vis vivid memory of Linda sitting at the picnic table outside the Brown Center at UNH talking to Aaron about bridges and about climate change. And Linda listening intently, asking lots of questions like you do. And Aaron picking up the phone, calling her husband and saying, hey, can you pick up the kids? This is really important. I need to stay here. And that was just this transformative moment, really exciting. Now, a little later on, Linda got onto this uncertainty thing at one of the meetings. <laughs> and our State Department of Transportation engineer, bridge engineer for the entire state, Bob Landry stands up and he says, you know what, you gotta stop talking about uncertainty because nobody wants to hear you're not certain about a bridge. <laughs> we talk about reliability. All right, what do you need to have this happen? Safe place for conflict, safe place for discussion. That's actually some quotes out of there. There's our climate, uh, one of our climate people telling us that these weather, uh, road weather information systems, the ones you see on the side of the road, they didn't have good data. The, uh, but he had just heard about it five minutes ago. Uh, convergence, we talked about convergence a little bit. We were living convergence. It takes time, it takes energy, and it takes an open mind. And this was one of our other State Departments of Transportation trying to explain to his other colleagues about how they might think and be much more open-minded about the changing climate when they considered engineering design practice. So it's nice early days. Now this put in purple to go with your outfit. And I look back at my old emails as I was putting this together. The oldest email I have is from Linda in 2014. That one oldest one I've kept. And it starts off saying, I'm gonna shower you with invitations. So somewhere along the lines, I we were doing something right. So Linda invited me to NCAR repeatedly to be the voice of transportation. It was, it was amazing, just amazing. And I would routinely get these emails from people out of the blue saying, can you participate in this National Academy study? Can you go to this event? And oftentimes I'd send Linda an email and say, what do you think? And she said, you should go. And I'm the one that was telling them about ICNET. So Linda was not only being part of this regional group, but she was also seeding the idea all over this nation about how important transportation was and getting us onto the stage. So thank you. So a couple of successes that have come out. Resilience planning. How many of you know this cycle or have seen this cycle before? All right, that's interesting. In the transportation world, this is where we live. We figure out where our vulnerabilities are. We prioritize the vulnerable assets. And then we make a plan to implement some sort of re risk reduction plan. We monitor the risk. And then we update and we keep going back and forth. In truth, we kind of get stuck in that like far right corner a lot of the time. Uh, we're really, really good at um, vulnerability assessments. And that's my highway to hell. Um, we get stuck there. If we don't know what to do, we do a vulnerability assessment. Uh, it's true. So, one of the things that we've, one of the successes we've had is at least with the vulnerability assessments, we're starting to, we've got a way to be able to infuse the right climate information in there. Not all cl global climate models are created equal. We need to know something about climate sensitivity. We need an ensemble of models. Don't just pick one. 
And so that has come through in the community and the community has grown and embraced that. Some other successes. This one we haven't seen yet, downscaling techniques for high resolution climate projections with some of the leaders in the field. Linda pulled in some of the, just pulled me in to give examples and case studies from the transportation community. Nice to have that footing. On the right hand side is some work that Rachel did with some of my folks on policy relevant research for engineering design on snowmelt flooding using NA Cordex. Some really nice and exciting. It's a nice juxtaposition about who the audiences are as well. And yeah, I've got a chapter in this one, the zombie book. I actually gave it a face too. <laughs> It'll come. So many of you uh, may know last spring, Linda uh, came home with COVID and was sick for a bit and missed our last IC, our most recent ICNET meeting. So I wanted to bring it to her and in turn update some of you on some of the things that we're excited about that are happening. And that's what happens at our meetings. We talk about new research that we're excited about. We talk about some of the things we're concerned about and we get an update on federal policy. So that's what I'm gonna do for you right now. So NOAA funding, NOAA has long funded different sectors to look at climate impacts. We finally got NOAA to say, to put the pavement folks in. And the team that was the ICNET team was able to get one of those awards. And we're looking at funding, we're looking at pavement resilience to sea level rise and flooding using natural and nature-based features. And there's so much good stuff in there. One, it's being led by the pavement engineers who are bringing in the right climate scientists. And they're also thinking about natural features. Oh goodness, thank goodness, because I bike a lot along the coastline. I don't wanna see berms and ugly concrete things. I wanna see pretty natural features. And Wentworth by the sea, like I said, NSF treated us well. That's where we hosted a number of times. And just south of there is one of our target areas for this natural and nature-based features, uh, the, Rye, the Rye Harbor area. One of the uh, post-event activities was doing a bike ride down the seacoast uh, to be able to see all of some of the different challenges in these areas. And the photo on the bottom right is, I think that is less than a, less than a year ago, one of, the, uh, one of the events that flooded and almost took out the bridge in that area. So natural nature, fe natural feature mapping. So one of the things we're trying to do with this is to help the departments of transportation understand how they can think about natural features. Because if you ask a transportation person, they'd say, that's the environmental cruise business. Not, that's not transportation. We track assets, we track the road, we track the culverts. We don't track salt marshes. And yet these salt marshes and beach and, and dunes and mangroves and other places, those are providing massive amounts of protection for infrastructure. And so it should be in transportation's interest to track that. And we're gonna make certain that it gets there. So they provide lots of flood protection. They buffer that, they attenuate the waves, they reduce erosion, really, really great things. And so some of the work that we've been doing is first figuring out how do you even do a GIS exercise of mapping where these assets are in a way that a, a state, a transportation person could relate to. And so we've developed a, a list of the different inventories that they can draw from. And then we've also linked these assets to the protections that they provide. Uh, here we've got um, all our different protections all the way along the coast, mainly lots of salt marshes. So a few dunes, a couple down that south area, and a lot of beaches. Nice long stretch of sand does a great job of protecting from, uh, from floods. And the work is paying off now. It'll pay off in the future, but it is paying off now because this little tiny little dune here is protecting that Hampton Bridge. And that dune is starting to move. It's starting to recede really, really quickly. But because these communities are starting to talk, the Department of Transportation is aware of it. They're starting to put in measures to figure out how to handle that. They're getting ahead of the problem as opposed to, oh my goodness, this protection is gone. Let's put a bunch of riprap in there and be done with it. 
And so I'm really excited about some of the partnerships that we've got there. So that's some of the new exciting research. The challenges piece, you know, I thought we'd have more time. Isn't that what we always say for about a lot of things? I thought I'd have more time. If I had to go back and do things differently with starting off ICNET, I would be I would be thinking about things a little bit differently because things are happening faster. I mean, it, it always works that way in retrospect. Things are happening faster than, I, than we planned. So while we were working on this project in December of 2022, so a little over a year ago, we had the second largest storm surge event on record. Blizzard of 78 was the first largest. And so we were like, wow, this is an amazing opportunity to gather a little bit of data and to see this. Turns out, the work, our work wasn't done. We had storms again in December. That was this at, at, uh, category five atmospheric river that went right up the entire Eastern seaboard. We had another storm that came through January 10th, followed by January 13th. Those are the largest storms on record and those are the largest storms on record. March 10th hit again. I mean, amazingly large storms. The devastation is tremendous. We're also starting to learn a couple things. One is we don't track where the damage is. We try to repair it as fast as possible. We try to get the, those orange signs off the road. We also don't know what causes a washout because our pavement engineers, as soon as the road gets washed out, they're like, not my problem put it back in place. The pavement engineer's problem is the rutting and the cracking. So the minor, the more minor failures. Interesting. Nobody knows what causes a washout. How is that even possible? So gaps in our understanding. It's happening, climate change is happening now. The other thing that I didn't see, calming down the pipe, we knew it was gonna happen eventually, was the bipartisan infrastructure law funds, trillion dollars worth of money coming at us. Two to three percent for resilience activities. That, that's well. That's all. Mm, that's still a lot. Two, first round, two point five billion were awarded in all fifty states. Every state does things differently. If they have a chief climate officer, they're lucky. Most of them don't have any sort of organizational structure to be able to really handle this. The other thing that came through that's really challenging is that of that 2.5 million, 2.5 billion, 38 states took advantage of a rule that says you can change, you can allocate up to half the money you receive to general funds. Interesting. And sem so over 700 million were allocated to general purpose. Some of those were will probably wind up back in resilience. They just didn't even have a pot to put the money in that they could call resilience. Some of them were probably plugging some holes. Okay, so a few uh, concluding points. The bill and protect, it's a start. Um, we're not ready for it, but we're more ready than we were 10 years ago. Uh, and there's really wide disparity. Put that $8 billion into context, the big dig which was the largest construction project. It was Boston undergrounding the central artery. That took 25 years, cost $24 billion. And Costa Samaras, who I was introduced by Linda, it, um, said, you know what, climate change resilience? That's like having a couple of big digs in every single state. We got a lot of work ahead of us. We have a lot of dollars. And the protect is not enough for a lot of reasons. We still need the interdisciplinary research. We still need the cross-cutting research and we need to bring in the next generation. So I'll thank my colleagues and I'll thank Linda. And one tiny last antidote. So on Tuesday, I went to lunch with Joe Sias, Gordon Airy from University of Nottingham, another pavement engineer, and Lee Fries. And I told them that we were going to the symposium and they said, Wow, in pavement, when somebody retires, they just kind of disappear. And they were like, that is a great idea. So one of your last legacies, I think, will be symposiums and celebrations of people's career in the pavement community. So thank you, Linda.
can be behind, but is there, do we have a quick question for Jennifer? Curious of examples, you know, money's being diverted where where some of this bipartisan infrastructure money might be doing, helping out and, and adaptation that might, do you have any yeah, success stories or? or yeah, there's some easy examples. examples. There's some bridges where the flooding levels have increased. And so um, there's two states, uh, there are two states that are using the funding in order to be able to um, raise the bridges and handle increased flows. Mm -hmm. How so much are they raising the bridges? That? How much are they raising the bridges? I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> okay, so let's move up. Our next speaker is Claudia Tibaldi, and she's online. So, Claudia, are you there? I am. Are you there? Yes. So, we need to, we'll get your presentation up. Claudia is going to speak to us on multimodal ensembles, uncertainty cascades, and the interdisciplinary work. It all started with Linda. So we see you, Claudia, and I oh, think you're uh, Okay, so uh, let me uh, put this in presentation mode. And uh, first of all, hi, everybody. I wish I was there with you. And hi, Linda. Uh, it's kind of awkward to give a talk about somebody without seeing them, but I'll try I'm not here. to. Yeah, yeah, I know you are. I, I actually saw you. Um, so, well, thank you for the opportunity of doing this remotely. Um, and I, Linda, I feel like people haven't um, sang your praises enough today. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. My presentation is not really about any, any result in science or anything. I, it's just, uh, uh, you know, an overview of these themes that have been really shaping my career and um, they all originated with you, with your example, with your vision, with your guidance. And um, I hope to, to tell a story that um, makes sense with the, with the uh, next slides. I had to, to, um, to add this parenthetical because I didn't want anybody to get offended when I said it all started with Linda. I'm sure there are other people that have thought about multimodal ensembles and certain cascades and interdisciplinary work. But for me, for me, it all started with Linda. And that kind of suggests that this, this talk is actually a lot about me. <laughs> and I, I hope you know me enough to know that. Um, you know, I, I tend not to to sing my my praises too much, but I have to to talk about me to talk about Linda. Oh, and Linda, I hope you appreciate the graphic here. I found a nice cloudy sky with purple undertones, and it's all for you. So um, it all started with this paper. Um, Filippo is no longer online, but. Um, uh, in 2002, Filippo and Linda published this paper that was mentioned actually, uh, maybe the, by Melissa. And um, I think it was the first paper that tried to make sense of multimodal ensembles by um, laying out a scheme to average their different and sometimes disagreeing um, projections at the regional level by making up um, ways that, that reflected each model's um, closeness to observation and each model closeness to the consensus of the ensemble. And um, after this paper was published, I was um, starting my career at NCAR as a staff scientist after my postdoc with Doug, who I think is in the room, uh, that Nitschke. Um, and, uh, Linda, um, oh, and I should say, I was actually in, in RAP, now RAL at the time, working with Barb, who I know is there as well. Um, and, and of course, uh, Rick Katz was, was um, a big um, figure um, because he, he was actually one of the PI for the project that brought both Doug and I at, at NCAR. Um, so Linda approached me uh, with this uh, with this paper, and she said, "What would you think about looking at this from a from a statistical perspective and try to interpret what we did from that perspective?" 
And at the time, you know, it made a lot of sense to me. And I went back to Doug and we started working on this. But, you know, as I reflected on this now, looking back, I think it was really, um, you know, uh, extraordinary of Linda to have that, um, can I use the word perspicaciousness? Um, that that Doug doesn't know uh, what it means. Um, to 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 actually have the um, the vision of um, saying, you know, uh, we come up with with this method, but um, it would be interesting to know what this method really um, assumes. And to do that, we need a, a formal statistical approach to the problem. I don't think ev any everybody would would have this. Um, sensitivity to this kind of issues. And uh, of course, as statisticians, we embrace the problem. And Doug and I wrote a comment on that paper. And I just want to read um, what we said. So uh, uh, we demonstrated that the method had a formal equivalent in statistical robust estimation. And we wrote in summary, George and Mearns choice is motivated by a sensible attempt at treating some of the differing outputs of the nine AOGCMs as statistical outliers with respect to a central value. This verdict is reached by them through a completely database procedure, but from a strict, strictly statistical perspective, their choice is equivalent to the optimal solution of a well-posed problem of robust estimation. So, um, this was the result of, of this first um, you know, um, exposure to the problem of multimodal ensembles. And from that, we took off really, and we wrote a lot of other papers. Um, I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm the common author in all these papers with a lot of different um, collaborators. Linda is part of uh, some of these, of course. Um, but this really um, kicked off my career, I would say, in, in the climate uh, change um, arena. And I'm still considered, you know, one of the multimodal ensemble um, climate change scientists out there. And um, it was not only, um, you know, an important um, area to work with, but it was um, very um you know, fundamental to to things, for example, like the IPCC. So um, Linda was working at the time uh, in AR4, and she asked me to be a contributing author uh, to write uh, a small uh, piece about this work. And uh, through that, I connected to other scientists, Isaac Held, among others. So it was really uh, a, an amazing, you know, channel for connections and and I started then working with uh, Jerry Mill, who of course was one of the fathers of the CMIP uh, enterprise. And to him, Ray Toknuti, um, with, with whom I wrote a paper that is still very cited about the, the problem of multimodal ensemble uh, projections. And I don't know what that says about my effectiveness in the area. Uh, it is still a big problem. It still keeps us on our toes, it, it's becoming more and more difficult uh, because of the increased diversity of the um, CMIP um, ensemble at every phase of CMIP. Um, but I really credit Linda for you know, making me aware of the problem uh, at a time when not many people were aware or um, you know, were thinking about uh, trying to, to do something formally about it. So Linda, thank you. Thank you for, for this. And um, I'm going on to another theme. Um, so personal issues brought me to um, leave NCAR and, and um, uh, go to the Stanford uh, campus. And at the time, Linda, again, uh, before the times, uh, allowed me actually to work remotely. At the time, it was not as common as it is now. And um, not only 
she did that, but she introduced me to really, you know, uh, giants of, of the field um, that were uh, at Stanford, Steve Schneider, Chris Field. So I didn't have to work in a, in a library on the campus. I actually had an office. I was connected to these amazing groups. And uh, of course, this was a result of Linda having um, seeded in me the interest not only for the physical climate science of things, but for the impact science side of things. And so uh, the connections felt natural. And uh, one of those connections was with David Lobel, who uh, was working, among other things, on agricultural impacts. Again, a theme that was familiar to me, thanks to Linda. And um, when we connected, David and I decided to, uh, you know, try to translate the probabilistic work that I had done on the climate projection side into, um, you know, probabilistic estimates of um, yield impacts. And we did. We um, wrote a paper. And when the paper was almost about to be ready, we sent it to Linda. The paper was called Probabilistic Projections of Climate Change Impacts on Global Crop Yields. And we asked her to read, her, to read the paper and to give us some feedback. And Linda did, and uh, she, she liked the paper, but she suggested a change in the title. And now if I could uh, hear the audience, I would uh, ask you to guess what she asked us to add. Um, I could give you the hint that it's actually a word that she used in the title of her presentation yesterday. Um, but since I cannot hear if any, anybody is, um, is guessing, I'll show you what the word was towards. So um, Linda liked the work, but in, uh, you know, in a very um, uh, long, long view type of perspective, she made the point that we were proposing just one um, solution to a small piece of the puzzle, and um, we needed to um, use some humility and uh, and possibly some irony. Another thing that I learned from Linda is to have a little bit of an ironic perspective in the etymological sense of the word to, to keep some distance and, and look at, uh, at, at things with a wide angle. So, so we add two words to our title. We publish the paper. And then I learned the lesson because I actually came up upon another paper that I wrote a few years later, this time uh, about health impacts. Again, another topic that Linda was a uh, key in uh, um, you know, familiarizing me on, uh, thanks to colloquia that she held uh, uh, regularly uh, with uh, people like Chrissy Bai, who I think was there yesterday, maybe not today, uh, Jonathan Pass. Uh, so again, an area of impact research that was familiar to me. And so I was part of this group that estimated uh, quantitative um, impacts in terms of mortality from heat wave. And that time, I don't think because of Linda, but because I had learned the lesson, I proposed to put a two word uh, in front uh, of a quantitative estimate. Um, so uh, I want to finish this with um, not where things started from, but where things are ending for me. Um, so, I left NCAR and um, I'm working at the Joint Global Change Research Institute, uh, which is part of PNNL. Ruby is one of my uh, bosses. <laughs> and um, I am working uh, in a truly interdisciplinary um, group. And I uh, have to thank Linda for um you know educating me to the to the type of of um interdisciplinary activities that i'm uh, that i'm 
um, busy with now. So I could have uh, kept on working on just analyzing the physical Earth system. Um, I still do that. Um, it's uh, it's rewarding and interesting. But what I find more rewarding and interesting is to connect that work with um, impacts. So using what comes out of our Earth system models uh, to as input to impact models. But uh, more recently, um, and thanks this time to somebody else that I think has 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 some connection to Linda because I think Linda uh, was director of ISE when he was hired, Brian O'Neill, who is at GCRI as well. Um, we are working on connecting impacts to um, a model of the human system. So translating those impacts into things that then the economic system made of, you know, energy, water, agriculture um, can use to say something about changes that then translate into emission and land use changes, which in turn will feed back into the earth system modeling. So we call this closing the loop. Um, it's, um, it's a very, uh, complex and, and um, you know, full of pitfalls type of, of uh, enterprise, but it's also very interesting. And um, I, again, I have to thank Linda for um, opening up these perspectives and, um, you know, making me pursue this, this type of work, which I really think is, uh, the frontier of our global change type of um, study, at least from a global perspective. So um, I, I wanted to mention so many other things, but and uh, uh, so many other people that that Linda was was uh, key in uh, connecting me to. But uh, I hope I have at least. Um, uh, mentioned the, the most important points and I'm done. Thank you. Time for a question or two for Claudia, if anyone has a question. It was not a, a science talk, so people probably don't have any, any questions. <laughs> So tell us, give tell us what you're working on now, on like like a like what off the table. What's your next paper? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, Ruby knows that I'm I'm struggling with flash droughts from the from the physical climate perspective, and then for these last things that that I mentioned, uh, we are trying to represent impacts on uh, you know agricultural productivity, like I I mentioned on the slides. Um, on uh, water availability, on uh, energy demand, like you know uh, how much people need to heat or cool their their homes into GCAM to then look at changes in GCAM's emission pathways. I see cat pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yes, Doug. Yeah. So, um, Claudia, I. I really enjoyed your talk. And, you know, as you know, I'm teaching in an applied math and stat department. Um, if you if if you have the chance to say, like, give a, a, a short course to um, statistics graduate students, what kind of um, what kind of tools would you give them so that they would be able to have a career like yours? And and be ready to wow. collaborate with that, that beautiful diagram that you ended with. Well, uh, more than the tools, I really feel like it's the it's the connection to the science community that really made a difference for me. So you know, the tools you learn and you they are not really the key. The key is to to have good colleagues and that that. Um, make you understand what the problem is really about and and um you know what what your statistical assumptions can or cannot reflect and and therefore you know how much the 
the things that you come up with really address what what the what the characteristics of the problem are. And and that, you know, we were lucky to have it at NCAR for a while. Um, and Linda were, uh, was really, uh, for me, key to that to that awareness. But of course, you know, there were other statisticians in NCAR like Barb and Rick that that were that were um, setting the stage for us to be to be trusted and accepted, which was not as um, as a straightforward, right? So, so it's both ways. It's the statistician being humble and 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 not put the method before the problem, and and the science, the science, uh, sorry, the scientist being open minded, like Linda was, and trust trusting. Not just the individual. I was thinking, you know, it's it's easy to trust the individual, but I think Linda trusted the the category, <laughs> the statisticians category, and 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 um, yeah. But, but I'm, but I always describe myself as a statistics groupie. Yeah, <laughs> well, you you are, you are, yes, you demonstrated that. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, yeah. Bye Linda. <laughs> So in, in, in addition to being a statistics groupie, you're also continuing being a mentor to many. So we're going to bring up two more of your mentees. <laughs> Rachel McCurry and Seth McGinnis are now going to talk to us about not where we expect you to go, a journey of discovery led by Linda Mertens. And I'm going to start us out. Um, do I need to put this on? Um, I would also uh, recommend your statistics applied math students work on um, soft skills into translation of statistics to non statisticians, <laughs> because that is my biggest barrier to understanding statistics is <laughs> understanding what what they're talking to me about. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so yeah, so Seth and I put this together because we both worked with Linda um, most recently. And, um, thankfully Melissa gave a good introduction to a number of things in her talk. And so I just wanted to start out with, I have this picture of Linda that she shared with us where she's in a wheat field, gave her a wheat field background as our, um, kind of uh, tribute to her. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so, um, oh, how do I, no, this is not, this is not, oh, there, I guess. Okay. Why is this? I got it. There we go. Okay. So this is just a little discussion. Like Claudia said, it's hard not to feel like this is a talk about you when you're talking about Linda, but Linda shaped your career. So this is a talk about both of us. Um, so this is um, scientific highlights and lessons learned with my 11 years of working with Linda. Um, and so um, these are just some of the funding agencies we've worked with and some of the large scale projects I've participated in with Linda and or in taking over a little bit of uh, leadership in as Linda has stepped away. And um, the first thing I want to say is just who am I? I mean, just this background of I have a master's and PhD in atmospheric science. I evaluated physical processes and global climate models, mostly drought and tropical convection. I had almost no experience. I had no knowledge of statistical downscaling, bias correction, barely had knowledge of regional climate modeling when she allowed me to join her group and thought I might be good at statistical downscaling, <laughs> which didn't end up working out quite that way, but I have a lot of knowledge in that area. Um, so I really came to work with Linda because I always think about this, that I would write these papers about drought, and then the first sentence I would say, drought is important to people, and then people would not be part of the rest of that paper. And I found that to be um, tiring. <laughs> What's the point of what I'm doing if no one's going to look at this? And so I wanted to come here and do um, applied use-inspired science rather than just this theoretical curiosity-driven science. And I would say we've had a blend of those. And so today I'm gonna to talk about a few key projects with Linda. And I'm glad some people from her, um, her undergraduate and graduate year, um, year, uh, career came and talked to her about her because the first project I was hired on with Linda was to study the impact of climate change on military installations in which Linda got to travel and talk to military people. <laughs> <laughs> and I always thought it was kind of ironic given some of her history. I'm also going to talk about some an area of work that Linda basically got me working on that I never thought I would have gone on, which is studying snow in regional climate models in particular. And then also I just have a few comments on the differential credibility analysis that 
Melissa shared in detail. So I just have one slide on that, nothing too fancy. So to start with, um, and I don't know if Richard Moss is on the phone, but one of the first two projects I was hired on was to basically look at um, understanding the data needs and decision-making to manage vulnerability over a DOD installations to climate change. And this project was funded by the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, which is basically part of the DOD and R&D project for the DOD. And in this project, we were looking at four military installations. It involved considerable stakeholder involvement, I thought this was gonna be the way my career was gonna go from that point forward as I was gonna to get to stakeholder, talk to stakeholders in detail at all times. Turns out that's actually incredibly challenging to actually get to have buy-in and funding to do, um, but it was really fun. It was my first foray into kind of this attempt to do co-production. I wouldn't, you know, um, so I was very new to that idea and um, it was a good eye-opening experience. Um, and so during this, um, through these interviews with base personnel, which was led primarily by Richard Moss and his team, although I did get to go to a few military bases and wander around um, Fort Hood and try to, um, no, Fort Bragg, and just talk to random people. They just gave us like free reign. It was fun. Um, we learned about certain um, climate weather um, hazards that they were concerned about. Heat stress for the ability to do labor outside, um, severe storms because of what it does to the damage to the inf um, infrastructure, um, including hurricanes, um, sea level rise and flooding, and then controlled burns for ecosystem management. Because on the East Coast, a lot of the public land is owned by the military, and they are required to do a number of things for maintaining um, ecosystem preservation for certain species. So Linda mentioned this yesterday, and I think this was one of the things, I don't know if this was not the first time you realized this, but really we honed in on installations with past influence and damage from weather extremes were more concerned about climate change and willing to work with us. Those that had never really experienced any significant damage thought they were completely resilient or invulnerable to weather and climate. And um, during this time also, if you notice the title of this talk was uh, Managing Vulnerability. We went to a lot of military installations and talked about vulnerability. And finally someone said, when working with the military, you do not talk about vulnerability, you talk about resilience. So I think in some ways, if we had framed this as talking about resilience, we may have had a little bit more buy-in from some places. I also had to deal with a lot of climate change deniers. That was also a fun um, exercise in learning to speak with different people. So in this, um, we developed, um, we looked at a number of things like the uncertainty in future temperature changes. This work was mostly done with NARCAP, changes in extreme precipitation. Melissa looked at changes in storm, severe storm environments. And then also, um, we didn't know going into this project that we would also be doing sea level rise. So we actually worked with um, Claudia and did a little bit of sea level rise, looking at future changes in inundation potentially for the uh, Naval Academy and Langley Eustis. Um, I also learned at this point that it's a time in which people need numbers in order to make plans, and they were very frustrated that there was no mechanism to get numbers to make plans. This is the engineering perspective on how big should a seawall be. <laughs> and so we developed this thing called a climate outlook. It's a report. It goes over what is climate change, what are climate models, what is the climate of your region, what should you be worried about. But as part of this, you know, we put a lot of this expert judgment into things. And we also developed our own confidence levels of how confident were we in terms of changes. And that was the first time I ever had to say I was confident in any scientific results of any kind, which was very nerve wracking because as scientists, we like to talk about all the things we don't know, not all the things we do know. Um, so then the stepping on, that was one project, but you know, during this time there was a lot of waiting and wondering and figuring out data. So one day Linda says to me, I literally think this was the conversation. Hey, Rachel, why don't you take a look at snow and NARCAP while we wait for other projects to get going? <laughs> and this turned into a research topic that I'm actually extremely passionate about and I hope to be working on um, for my lifelong career pursuit. And it's resulted in many collaborative publications, including one with Jennifer Jacobs and um, kind of just an interest in the complexity of modeling snow and kind of integrating different communities. And so through this work, I came to this from this global modeling perspective where we just evaluate models with the data set, like GPCP is what you do for precip. So I said, cool, I'll download the snow data set, the snow water equivalent data set, and I'll evaluate the models. And this led me into a, probably over a year of being like, there are no snow observational data sets, or if they are, they're really bad, or what are we supposed to do? And so um, I created this ensemble of gridded snow water equivalent products. And I looked at basically this uncertainty across these products. And this is a methodology I continue to use at this point, because especially when looking at gridded products, we can't just look at a single point and measuring snow from space is extremely difficult. And so we kind of have to use these blended methods. And so 
I actually got to publish the term and I didn't put on here mob observations, which is modeled observations. It's in our paper and I call them mobs and I'm the most proud of that probably and no one actually notices it, but it's fine. Um, so one of the things that we showed in this was that if you consider the observational uncertainty in SWE and in looking at our model bias, we can really change our perception of how biased these models are. So the figure on the left shows model bias just relative to the median of the observations, whereas the figure on the right shows this kind of looking outside the range. And so they still have a lot of bias, but it's lower. And so, and if we go back to this, when we're looking at models here, we can say, well, there's a lot of spread in the observations and some people might argue there's more credibility to some of those than others, but I would say really even understanding the uncertainty, quantifying the uncertainty in those observations is challenging. Um, but that's kind of one of the things I've done. The other thing with using NARCAP with this really unique design that Linda was able to put together, we were able to look at kind of some of the drivers of uncertainty and future change. One of the first things that we saw with NARCAP, um, the previous result was looking at the NSEP driven runs, but when we started to look at the GCMs, one of the things that really stood out from looking at this was that in fact, most of the bias came from the RCM, not the driving GCM when it came to snow. And this in large part, I believe basically going through things has to do with what the land surface model does with elevation and a lot of parameterization options related to um, surface snow. But then also the fact that like the Canadian model always had this cold bias. And so you're gonna have more snow in that model. Then looking forward into the future change, again, we can see here that a lot of the, the, the magnitude and the spatial patterns associated with future change were also driven in large part by that regional climate model, not necessarily the driving GCM. This isn't true for all variables, but when it came to this land surface stuff at the, in these model runs, it really was depending on what happened with the land surface. Um, again, then moving on, um, we started to look at the role of model resolution. So the development of Cord NA Cortex, we had both 50 kilometer downscaled simulations and 25 kilometer downscaled simulations. So we could look at what was happening at these scales in terms of multi-model ensemble and uncertainty. And you know, highlighting things that people kind of know, but really quantifying them, looking at how much we have this reduction in snow loss if we start to um, increase in resolution because mountains are high enough that we don't have as much loss, at least in terms of total percentage. And also some interesting changes that happen with elevation, especially in the Rockies where it still stays pretty cold, even in a warmer climate. Uh, my last slide here, oh, my second last slide here is basically this differential credibility analysis that M Melissa talked about. And I just wanna clarify that this was actually the second project I was hired to work on um, in which we spent a lot of time trying to look at simple comparisons of these methods and trying to figure out a really good framework for doing this. And it, you know, it gets really complicated because you're not really comparing apples to orange apples. You're looking at a lot of different data sets that are manipulated in different ways. And what are you supposed to do? And I'm really proud that we finally got the whole team involved, not just me. And now Melissa, Seth, Linda, and I have come up with this framework where we finally, after a long time, have this kind of process level analysis that we've been able to distill enough to actually get to some concrete what might be happening in these methods. And so I'm excited to see that. And so I just wanted to share my life lessons learned from Linda Mearns. And some of these, you just have to know Linda. But the first part is when making plans, always make sure everyone's on the same page, in the same book, in the same edition. <laughs> Got to be really distill that down. Lunchtime conversations result in lifetime, um, lifelong friendships. Strategic ambiguity can keep you out of a lot of trouble. <laughs> Co-production is hard, but it's totally worth it. And resilience is the key to a successful scientific career. So thanks. Oh, microphone. All right, so I'm Seth McGinnis, and I am going to talk about, in contrast to a lot of other people, I'm gonna talk about one thing that I learned from Lynn, uh, working under Linda for about 17 years. Um, yeah. <laughs> so my career path has been highly nonlinear. Uh, my undergraduate was in physics and earth atmospheric planetary sciences at MIT. And I went to CU and got a PhD in kind of a roll your own uh, uh, major in uh, chaos theory and complexity, studying earthquakes. Um, and then for a little while, I did some, some uh, contract work at Stratus Consulting, a uh, little bit of a foreshadowing there, updating uh, computer code for Magic Sengen. And then I got hired at NCAR to work on an educational computer game about natural hazards. <laughs> and how I ended up here is that as that project was winding down, Linda said, well, I've got a couple things you could work on. Um, and so then 
I ended up doing a lot of different things uh, working with Linda. Um, I did some visualizations for that that AR4 IPCC, <laughs> um, and I I did an estimation of like if you if you calculate if you spread the the uh, um, Nobel Peace Prize money out over all the amount that everybody had contributed to those uh, the the documents, Al Gore owes me about twenty two cents. Um, <laughs> We made this little website to provide uh, climate projections all over the world to people. Uh, and then I got into doing data management for NARCAP and data management for the NA Cortex data project. And that includes data visualization and bias correction and model evaluation and machine learning and website development and graphic design, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we have this long list of things that people do with climate data. And I've, these are projects that I have worked on is stuff having to do with storm drains, and stream flow and water quality and salamander con conservation and white nose disease in bats, which is one of Linda's absolute favorites. Um, simultaneous large wildfires, heat wave mortality, excess heat in Texas prisons, municipal cooling shelters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Overall, and this is what I tell people I do when they're, when, you know, when I tell lay people what I do, it's making climate data useful to people who aren't climate scientists, right? That's, that's what I basically do. And what I have learned in doing that, climate data is weird. <laughs> <laughs> climate data, climate models do a lot of things that lay people do not expect and that trip them up and that you have to explain to them. Um, one of the big ones is that there's no correspondence at all between what actually happened in the real world on a particular date and what happens in a climate model on a particular date. There's just no relationship at all. Um, people do not expect that. Uh, there are all these map projections you have to deal with. Those are the map projections from NA Cortex or from NARCAP. Um, and some of these map projections are very strange. Um, and people, so people either don't know anything about map projections or they do. And then they start asking things like, hey, what datum did you use? And the climate scientists say, what's a datum? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, we have different calendars. Um, we have calendars that don't have leap years in them. We have calendars that have 360 days in every year, um, which I personally really hate. <laughs> Bias exists and you have to do things about it. So th there's all these things that are like stuff you have to tell people who are gonna use this data about when they are non-specialists. And then I started talking to philosophers of science, uh, which is another thing we can credit to Linda or blame Linda. For. Um, this is a group of climate scientists, including uh, Lisa Lloyd and Monica Morrison, who's in, here in the room. Um, this is another one of those, something I never really particularly expected to do, but that went some pretty cool places. And I, I'm a co-author on a paper in the, the journal Philosophy of Science. And a couple of years ago, I gave a talk at the Philosophy of Science Association meeting. And what I learned from that is, no, no, it's even weirder than that. <laughs> So let's talk about some characteristics of climate data that are kind of weird. First off, and this is just sort of like a baseline thing for the other stuff, climate is aggregated weather, right? Climate is what weather does over the long term. I know, I know the uh, education and outreach folks are, are fond of saying, climate is your face and weather is the expression on your face, right? <clears throat> yeah. Um, and, and basically the thing is, you need a lot of weather data to get climate. You can't get climate from just one day's worth of data. You need a lot of it to get climate data. Um, so the first thing is that's weird is that climate data is not climate data R, which is to say data in climate is a mass noun, not a count noun. It's milk, it's not cookies, because we are studying continuous fields that are varying over time and we're sampling the values in time and space, right? And so that means that an individual data point kind of really doesn't mean anything at all. Like this is, this is a picture of humidity over North America on a particular day and any individual pixel there is not really gonna tell you anything. You have to look at the whole thing to, to get something out of it. Individual data points have very little meaning. That's weird. Um, that is not true in a whole lot of fields of, of science. Our individual data points, mm, who cares? It's, it's only the, the big picture that sort of starts to come together and mean something. Um, also weird, there's only one atmosphere, right? We have a singular object of study in our field um, and weather systems have global scope. You know, if you care about weather over North America, 
you have to be concerned about what's happening in Africa with tropical easterly waves and things like that. So everyone who's doing climate is studying the same thing. That's weird. Um, also, weather happens once and then it's gone. You can't pause it, you can't rewind it, you can't replay it. So all of our observations are precious because also we need a lot of observations and we want them in the past and we can't get those. So we have to hold on to all of the observations we've got. Observations are precious. Um, that's not true in a lot of fields. A lot of fields, you just go get more observations, you know, make some more if you, if you don't have them. Um, also, weather data is public. Um, collecting weather data is really simple and it's hard to make it proprietary. You just walk outside and say, is it raining? You know, and if somebody wants to keep their observations proprietary, it's not like I can't be a block down and walk outside and see basically the same weather. You know, you look at the sky. It's, it's hard to keep people from looking at the sky. Uh, also, everybody uses it, right? That's, that's from an app on my phone. You've got an app on your phone that tells you what the weather data is for today. And for climate, we need weather from a lot of different data sources to sort of make this big picture, right? So that means there are strong incentives to share weather and climate data. That is weird. There are a lot of fields where people are very jealous and very possessive about their data sets and they do not want to share them at all. So we have really strong incentives to share our data. That's unusual. Uh, also, the earth does not fit into a lab. Uh, we can't do bench experiments. Um, we don't have other earths that we can compare to. So if we wanna get experimental data, we have to do simulations instead. Um, all, all of our experimental data is output from simulations. That is very weird. That is not true in most fields. Um, and uh, finally, climate models are expensive. They're actually not just models of the atmosphere, they're models of the entire Earth system and they keep getting more and more complicated. And you can't just run them on your laptop, you need these expensive purpose-built supercomputers and they take a long time to run. You know, We're talking days or weeks or months of wall clock time. So when we make these computers, com climate simulations, they're a community effort. They're not things that just one person does. They're, they're a thing that the whole community does. That's weird. And what this all comes together to mean is that in climate science, sharing data is the norm, right? Because climate observations are built from public data and everybody needs the data and we need it from everywhere. And we have to use simulations to experiment. And those are a community effort. We create data sets expecting that other people are gonna use that data. And that is really, really strange. It took me a long time working with, working with the philosophers of science to even understand what they were getting at because my mindset was based in this and it's so different to what a lot of other fields do. Um, climate science is data centric. In our field, the most central thing is data. It's not theory, it's not experiments, it's data. What that means, is that data archives drive climate science. So these are the two data archives I've been involved with. Um, NARCAP, if you Google NARCAP on Google Scholar, there are 3,000 plus results. <laughs> now, surely, now I know some of those are, are duplicates and things like that, but that is a lot of science that happened because this data archive exists. Um, we also, you know, uh, it was also a data set that pioneered assigning DOIs to data sets here at NCAR uh, before people even knew what DOIs were. Um, and NA Cortex, you know, it's a similar data set. It was included in the IPCC AR6 Atlas. Um, and the latest stats I have is that we get about 150 people every month downloading about 1,700 different data sets, um, subsets of the data from NA Cortex, and, you know, about five terabytes total every month. That's a lot of data, and that is a lot of science that has been enabled uh, by these data archives. And Linda was the driving force behind these data archives. And uh, I think that's a pretty awesome legacy to leave behind, and I am happy that I got to be a part of it. Thanks. Um, I just want to say I realized I missed a slide on mine, which was that 
we are still pursuing some of Linda's legacy in this way and that we are, Linda's not paying attention, but we are pursuing uh, North America Cortex, CMIP 6. We have some money to do that. Melissa is currently volunteering her expertise to help contribute to this as well as Stefan Rahimi who's here. So we're still trying to push forward this downscaling multi-model ensemble NA Cortex. Stefan's not here, he'll be online. Um, and then, um, yeah, just wanted to share that we are trying to do this. Yes. We but don't we don't know how to get funders to all work together. Yeah. <laughs> Can you come back as a casual to help us? <laughs> well, we have both here who's got questions. Anyone want to throw a question out? Everyone wants to get to lunch. Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 yeah. So Jean Talkley asked a question online, actually during Melissa's talk. But it kind of applies here too. Jean, did you want to unmute and say that? Or... Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, yes, uh, I'm just wondering if you have looked at the, any of the bias corrected using the emergent constraints uh, uh, process that was discussed in AR6. Uh, for driving uh, simulations in the in the central U.S. region, where the uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the warming hole, have you had any regional discussion, regional simulations that can trace it back to those emergent constraint uh, bias corrections? I, I didn't realize it at the time, but there is some of that. It's not directly in the most recent version of the DCA work, but it is in the Southern Plains work. It was just with the dynamical models. Um, and then I was told it was emergent constraint work because we have actually tied some of what's going on in the future projections from the models to past observations. So quite a bit of what we're seeing in the projections is happening. And that's as close as we've come. Monica. Okay, I have a question. I think I know the answer, um, but I'm going to ask it anyways. So one of the things, Seth, that you pointed out is that unlike other sciences in climate, sharing data is, an, is the norm, right? Um, so do you think that with respect to what our responsibilities are in climate science when sharing data, that they differ than maybe what other sciences are doing in terms of providing guidance on appropriate use? what responsibilities we have to prevent misuse, stuff like that. I, I think they do. I don't know very much about what other fields do. Um, but thinking a little bit about the paper we wrote with Lisa about what biology does, yes. um, uh, I think um, there's more concern about, you know, trying to make sure that people are, we can't, we can't prevent people from doing dumb stuff with our data, but we can do our best to make it easy for them to do smart stuff. And I think we feel some obligation to try to do that, to try and make the data useful in ways that will be helpful to. Yeah, well, I was going to say we feel obligated to do that. Yeah. But I wouldn't say that's a generalized norm across our field. Okay. No. <laughs> About beyond the scope of expertise. I mean, okay. we do let talk to experts about it, but I don't think people just... I put my data on the repository. It's available. I made it public. Mm. <laughs> Period. <laughs> yeah. So there's work to be done in maybe realizing and acting on some of our yeah. moral responsibilities to help people use data in informed ways. Yeah. Yep. Um, so this is really pertinent because it's something we talk about a lot when I've got my WMO hat on is, you know, your data is more important to me than my data. And that's why, you know, through cold wars and hot wars, we share our data. But one of the things that we're grappling with now that I'd love to get your viewpoint on, especially Seth, since you've worked in private industry, there's a lot of private data kind of flooding into the system and every phone mm. is a source of mm. atmospheric observations now of questionable quality, even if you're, you know, confident of the geolocation. And so and, and so we're starting to try to think, what are we going to do with this? Because the IBMs of the world are going to use this data. And how do we in the research community kind of inject some positive data hygiene into that? <laughs> um, 
that's a that's an interesting point, and I haven't thought about it much, but I guess I would say off the top of my head, I I the thing that that strikes me as is that it's it's kind of like NASA satellite data, right? Which is there's the raw stuff that is coming straight from your sources, and you have to do a lot of stages of processing to turn that into something that's sort of generally useful if you're not a specialist in using data from that source. And so I guess maybe what we ought to be as a community thinking about is let's get some people working on taking that raw data and turning it into excuse me, a product that is useful and that you know people have done things like said, oh, this whole section of data that the geolocating is, is junk, let's throw those out and things like that. I, I think that's the thing we're gonna have to do. And you know, probably we might be able to get some of the uh, private industry producers on board with helping with that and making it um, freely available for scientific research, you know, public use and getting money off of the private uses of it. I think we also serve um, a role in it, you know, flipping that on the other side is that the um, organizations are using our data to make um, kind of like specialized um, climate change vulnerabilities, assessments change, and I think that there needs to potentially be a better avenue for um, scientists and data producers to act as stewards of the fidelity of that data and what's happening for those endpoints. Like being this, there's someone creating data, someone, should you be really using it and trusting it? Where do we sit in that? So. I'll bring in a slightly different perspective on this. I work mostly in the health sector and I'm not speaking about you specifically, obviously, but in general, there's been this real lack of interest in the part of climatologists to want to work in the health sector. Mm -hmm. I get regular phone calls on, I want to get all the health data, to which the answer is you can't. <laughs> and, and this is a long, long conversation on why you can't. And just like, would you like your health data? Just no. <laughs> they actually don't actually get that. But eventually I communicate, they're never going to get it. Mm -hmm. unless they collaborate and that's the end of the conversation oh. they just will not further collaborate mm -hmm. and so i hear you very much on the collaboration within the field but with but reaching out to other fields it it, it hasn't been working particularly well and I, I, that's another where yeah. it's weird yeah mm -hmm. i suspect it might be because they say oh that's gonna be a lot of work is there a similar project that might be less work or <laughs> it's about funding no, so that's true. Is that we're not really funded sufficiently to do the work across. So we might be maximized in our funding that we want to do this. And you're saying, come work with us, but that's not for free. And so then where do we get that, you know, finding those cross between? Us? There's there's no, well, then we should write a proposal. There's well, none of that. that just, be if I can't have your data, I'm out of here. And <laughs> it's, it's a very odd set of interactions. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are physical scientists for the most part. We have. Interesting social skills. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, when you say, I, well, it's just this whole thing is amazing. I mean, what can I say? Um, but yours in particular are amazing because, like, you know, we work very close together. Um, this is a question for Ro Rachel about. The stakeholders, the um, the military stakeholders. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the problems with that whole project was that it was it was very much kind of buckshot, like you know, mm -hmm. there was no in depth work. So, for example, let's take the Fort Bragg people who were very um, well thought they were pretty invulnerable. Mm -hmm. climate change, as I recall. Um, do you imagine if you, if we had just been working with them alone over time, that their position would have changed? Or do you think their position was just, that was it, and further talking with them wouldn't have made a difference? Um, so I think that part of the problem, and 
if Richard Moss is on the phone, he could totally correct me, was that, a, well, first of all, this program, there's almost no incentive that, while well, it sort of asks us to work with military installations, right. there's no incentives for the military installations to work with right. us. Right. So I'm on other projects in which we are trying, supposed to work with installations and there's no avenue to make that happen right. unless we just ask nicely and people don't respond. <laughs> so that's one problem there. The second problem is that I think initially all their conversations were with high level military personnel. But we finally had a meeting in which the contractors, the civilians who worked on the base, who were, had the longevity of being on the base, came and talked to us. And that's when we first started to get like this idea of controlled burns in that area and how important it was for them to manage controlled burns, partially because they didn't want smoke coming in to the mil their, their, onto the base when high level officials were visiting. Mm -hmm. So they had to manage not only the weather, but the timing of when the weather occurred and people were visiting. Oh. So yes, and I actually think they were more closely associated with another project that was doing detailed analysis basically only there. Um, and so yes, I think longevity would have been better. I mean, I wasn't, I think that getting people to talk to us at all is a pretty big challenge that they faced and we were kind of insulated from that um, as well, so. I will, I will follow up and say also that based on the firework that I've been involved with, where we've been talking to stakeholders over multiple years, um, it does help to have repeated conversations oh, yeah. with the same people over a long time. And one of the things that happens is some people, you have conversations with them, and it, after a little while, you determine, oh, okay, we cannot provide you with anything that you want. So let's let's not talk anymore because this is not going to go anywhere. But then you find the other people who, you know, they sort of start to say, oh, maybe I could use that. And, you know, yeah. but then you have to do the whole process of like, what do you mean when you say the word conservative? Oh, I meant the opposite. I mean, we just had this conversation where I thought, oh, why are we talking to these people? They want data we can't provide. Yeah. And then when we met, it was like, they just didn't understand. And now they're like, oh, well, maybe we could do something with the data you have. Now that we understand why the data is what we think of that. Like, <laughs> so that was really fascinating to me. So, should we have lunch? Yes, yeah, so I think there was, there was, I was, I was gonna, gonna say, know. when you were talking about some of the military people were, it had experienced weather events yeah. and they were more open. It seems like they would have been good influencers of the other ones, right? I don't know how much military installation people talk to each other. We were yeah. also crossing Navy and Army. Um, and the Army was definitely Army Rangers. Army Rangers, Rangers can do anything. <laughs> they are invulnerable. <laughs> do not talk about vulnerability. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I know that, so I know Hurricane Irene was one that hit this area that people military like Langley Eustis and the Naval Academy were hit really hard during this hurricane. And so I know there was a lot of discussion also not with just the military, but the surrounding communities. And I know I think at this point they are building an adaptive seawall mm -hmm. because of this, but mm -hmm. I think um it I'm not good at the how do you get people to talk to each other <laughs> science. <laughs> yeah. Well, on that note, let's yeah. talk to each other at lunch. Yeah. Okay. So, you guys get to turn on one fifteen.